to have her with us. Jude is an artist and a curator and a singer and many other things and she also has a radio show on Resonance FM. So we thought she would be the perfect person to moderate this uh, this talk. I would just say we are filming this so if you don't feel comfortable with that you might want to just shuffle back a little bit. Um, Thank that's you. everything about Jude that I can remember in yes. 20 Thank seconds. <laughs> but we're very pleased to have you with us, so thank you very much. And I think Rebecca's going to talk about our speakers. And on our panel we have Valeria Napoleone, who has a world-renowned art collection that's by women artists. And she's also recently founded a project called The XX which is um, designed to support also museums collecting women, in, uh, representing women in their collections. And um, I was lucky enough to attend a tour of her collection in her home about a year and a half ago. And it just resonated with me and stayed with me since that time. And it was really lovely to meet her. So we're really delighted she came today to participate. And we also have Sara Berman here, who's an artist that I met through finding her on social media. And I thought, wow, I love her painting. So that's also what's a fun thing about organizing these events because you get to call people you don't know well and say hey. <laughs> um, so Sarah's work deals a lot with identity and the female form in kind of um, interesting spaces and that's what really resonated with me. Sarah has a background in fashion and this morning we were talking about how interesting it is how you can um, kind of you're curating paintings or you're curating uh, fashion. There's a lot of similar ties in there as well. And um, we also have Neve White here, who is a curator of Denton's Art Prize, which is supported by Denton's Law Firm. And she's been running that for two years now. Yeah. Um, and it comes with the Denton's Art Prize, which is wonderful because it supports emerging artists. And she also, um, about a year and a half ago, founded Hospital Rooms with her partner, Tim Shaw. And that's also a big part of why we're so excited to have everyone here today, too, because we organized a fundraiser to support Hospital Rooms, which is an arts mental health charity where Neve and Tim commission artists to go in and transform the spaces inside hospitals so that they're much more um, beautiful and, and fantastic to be in for the service users. So we're really delighted to have such a great panel here of a curator, an artist, a collector, and bring together the conversation. And thank you very much, Jude. Thank you. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I had to rush from my radio show, driving through the middle of London, all a bit flustered, but here I am. And it's great to see everybody here in this railway arch and in this rather industrial feeling room and to be seeing the art displayed here for uh, all the different um, small paintings that we've got um, contributing to hospital rooms. Um, I wonder how many people really know what hospital rooms is. Thank you for coming. But I, I think that would be a great place to start. So I would really like to begin by talking to Neve White, yeah, um, of course. the curator, because you're the woman behind hospital rooms. Yes, so myself and Tim Shaw, who's an artist, my partner. Um, and Hospital Rooms, it's a registered charity, and what we do is commission world-class artists to completely transform secure and locked mental health units. Um, so the idea is that if you can kind of transfer the value that we allocate to our cultural spaces, our museums, our galleries, and put them in places that have been historically made invisible, uh, underfunded, largely neglected, <coughs> that we can um, kind of subliminally challenge ideas about mental health um, and, and accompanying that make people's quality of life better. Um, so we work with lots of different kinds of artists and they work to a very tight brief which makes them even more creative I think um, and we bring them into the units and um, we change them. <coughs> How does it work when you take somebody whose work is in a very different area? Because it's not like you're making <coughs> art for the gallery. And there's often expectations about contemporary art that you need to surprise people with your work and have a certain impact. How does that relate when you're making work as an artist that's inside a hospital or um, for people who are not a contemporary gallery audience like that? Um, so we're quite specific about who we invite to participate. 
and we're only a small organisation, we've been going for 18 months and we're on our fifth project so far. Each project has about six to eight different artists taking part and we think really carefully about who we invite and we have a fairly long process. So we'll go through about eight months um, from start to finish and each artist visits the mental health unit that we're working in. We put this emphasis on co-production, so the artists have to meet the community. They speak to the staff, they speak to service users, they speak to carers or family members. And it's not that we are asking for people to say, I want a tree over here, here please do a tree. We're asking them to listen, interpret, um, and really kind of gather up all of that information and then respond imaginatively um, with a daring quality, with, with all of the creativity that they bring to their own practice, but with a suitability for the environment. And we support them in that as well, in terms of fabrication and regulation around hygiene, security, self-harm, all of those things. It sounds really a, a complex operation over a long period. Um, and what are the, the results? What kind of rooms have been transformed? So we've had a really nice variety. Um, the regulations in the units mean that most of the work is intrinsic to the building by the time we finish because we have issues around objects. You know, it's very difficult to put <coughs> objects in the spaces. So um, Michael O'Reilly, for instance, he is a Royal Academy Schools graduate. He's now a scenic painter at the Royal Opera House. Um, visited the Phoenix unit, the first project that we worked on, and he decided to work in the quiet room. And we often ask artists to think about function, to think about the idea of fit for purpose um, and how we might expand that. And um, his idea was to paint a domestic interior in Trompe l'oeil within the space. So he painted a beautiful ornate wallpaper and a series of posters, artworks, framed works, completely flat to the wall, but they wow. look 3D. You know, it looks like a domestic space that you can sit and be and explore over a period of time. Um, you know, transformed from this kind of pastel, harsh space. Um, other artists have um, Mark Power, who's a Magnum photographer, was working um, in Phoenix where service users might have a two hour break and a, um, like a leave to leave the unit per day. So he took walks that took that period of time and photographed trees and um, little found objects and then made them into this kind of wallpaper and so everybody could recognise all of these images that he had put together and composed. You know, very thoughtful, very... Yeah. And I think, there are, I think bringing artists in, you know, we're not consultants, we're not designers, we're not interior designers, you know, we really want them to be daring and to be imaginative and to bring all of those thoughts <coughs> Um, to really, you know, change what care can be. It really seems, both those examples <coughs> really seem to stimulate the imagination of uh, people who'd encounter them. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, in a way that you don't expect to get in a hospital environment. So it really seems to be meeting that kind of imagination brief. Because it's about sort of almost, it seems to me, hospital rooms a little bit about increasing the mental space in which you are in in the hospital because it's too easy for the um, it's too easy for rooms to define you mm. and you've, you've given them more to explore absolutely and we give people conversations you know we bring back a human aspect I think you know the, the room that the wallpaper went into is the, called the relatives room so it was where people would come and visit and actually it can be quite um, intimidating in a way because you can hear things through doors and you're locked in spaces and so the experience of visiting that room is actually a little bit difficult particularly if you're a young person or an older person you know um, but it it offers something to talk about too you know that is separate from diagnosis or medication or <coughs> anything else it's is a human thing yeah it makes you feel human again and, and that the waiting that happens in institutions it's um, giving 
it's giving form, it's giving a texture to the waiting, mm. I think, that you can uh, imaginatively relate to. So I think it sounds fantastic. I'd love to see them in person, I must say, I'm really... Actually, I did um, bring a book, so I'll share you? it with people, yeah. Oh, great. If anybody wants to have a look at these afterwards, Neve has, has a book. Um, Sarah, I must turn to you because I'm going, it seems to be going, <laughs> so Sarah Burnham, you're an artist, you're a painter, yes. a great painter, and yeah. I know that Rebecca was saying how much she fell in love with your work on Thank online, you. And, and you also have a history as a businesswoman, as a mature artist who's had a, a, a fashion, a yes. fashion business? Yes, I had a fashion line for 15 years, and it's actually funny, um, listening to this discussion about um, uh, bringing artists in to to respond to something where there is a a very real sense of there's a purpose and the work must be fit for purpose and I think that's that's a very interesting uh, position to put an artist into and I think for me that was the biggest boundary in going from fashion from a designer where there is a right and a wrong and there is a sense that if the project doesn't meet its criteria then you have failed and in failing there is nothing positive as a designer mm. but as an artist uh, failure is kind of intrinsic to what we do and it's incredibly important to, to learn to embrace failure and almost start the project the other way around you're asking artists to to envisage what they need the work to do at the end point whereas most of the time and I think well for, for, I can't speak for every artist but for myself I don't know what I'm looking for in the work until I find it so I think it's probably a very interesting discussion that the artists themselves are having with this project because yeah. they're having to go at it a totally different way they're not you're, you're not able to see where it takes you. you there's not an exploration the exploration is very different you're asking them to be to project themselves forward and anticipate what other people's needs are in relation to the work whereas mm -hmm. I think normally or not normally but um in my experience, you, you make a piece of work and then you're asking many questions with this piece of work and the work's function is to let other people engage with it and see what questions it asks them or that they, they get from it. And it's quite interesting to think about it the other way around. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite a terrifying uh, project in a way for an artist to offer. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I can't imagine what it would be like, how many questions and things you must ask yourself if you were doing a brief like that to produce a work in, in a permanent work in an environment that you know is so important and it can't fail. Yeah. So it's uh, it's asking different things of the artists, which is uh, very interesting. I think. Yeah, it's definitely a challenging brief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think also people change, uh, you know, throughout the project. And lots of artists say, the idea I can't do it is completely changed. You know, <coughs> having met this person, I've mm -hmm. changed this. Now I'm going to do this. You know, and also it's a, um, it's a lot of back and forth with Tim and I as well in terms of fabrication and what things can be even. Um, so yeah, it's a challenge. But the boundaries themselves, you feel, engender a lot of possibility and yeah, creativity. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it's a, it's an interesting way for artists to be asked to work, and yes. sort of yeah, and what they think they might do is probably very different to what they end up doing. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, would you say your practice nowadays is is more? Um, conventional isn't the right word, but but more of a. The artist on their own, with their own agenda, creating their yes. own work to their own pleasure, for their own pleasure, or, or whatever they feel is what they're trying to achieve. There's nobody who's standing over you, or, or you're not having to work to any brief apart from that which you set. No, I mean I definitely work on my own, and in fact, have just last week taken my studio all for myself. Um, it's not mine. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, uh, so yeah, I very much want to be alone and I really enjoy a solitary practice. Um, yeah. And I think, that's, so, I think that's, that's the work I make. I like to be alone. I don't... Um, I actually, as I said, I found the lack of boundaries in painting was my first real challenge to kind of overcome as an artist. And then sort of realising how I can find that and deal with that, I now absolutely want no boundaries to the point where I will actively issue any kind of projects if I don't feel I'm in a place to take them on or if I think the work might suffer as a result. Um, 
and yes I'm in, I'm in dialogue with the work and that's my priority is to be fully engaged with the work at all times and happy with it if you're not happy with it then nothing's going to happen uh, do you feel that because you've come uh, from your running your business that you're slightly in conversation with that time or is it um uh, in this, or maybe there's a cut off in the in it, so it's a different way of working. Are you quite keen to establish this time in your life or this uh, this type of work as something in opposition? To well, there's sort of two things that happened there. I was definitely uh, I didn't know how to deal with it as a painter when I first started really being serious about painting. I found it difficult to understand how fashion worked as a part of what I was doing. Um, now I don't feel the same way and it comes into my work quite freely um, I feel that in working in fashion you're simply dealing with people and spaces in different ways you know the bodies of space we inhabit our clothes and there's a conversation about curation and identity and authenticity that's kind of innate to the fashion world um, and it's definitely the sector that I was in um, and for me with my work I'm, I'm examining that same conversation spaces that we exist in and how we exist in them and what the what the role of self is amongst all the stuff that we have um, so I don't feel the conversation is terribly different but I think the way of approaching it is very different yeah I mean I've, I've looked at your work on online I'd love to see something in the flesh but it's very painful <laughs> may I point you yeah. just turn around the big one yes, we still have a look yeah, so they're, they're fair with these here. What I noticed online, and I can see from here as well, it's very painterly work. You're really working with the paint as yeah. a media. Um, and it's a lot of... Uh, and you're engaged with the domestic setting. Yeah. And maybe slightly influenced by photography and angles of... Um, I uh, see the legs and some of the pictures on your website, legs coming in from the side, so the person is... Um, hidden apart from their legs so there's bits of the body making yeah. a graphic statement yes. in it I think I'm very interested in flattening um, and that definitely comes from a design background, this idea of uh, flattening something to enhance or to push back and I'm interested in ways we, that we see things and distorting those ways that we see things, maybe asking questions about angles, <coughs> positions um, so how, how we interpret the things around us and the, and the value systems that we create. I sort of call them museums of self, which um, I realise is incredibly cheesy, but I sort of think we do create a sort of around us with our clothes, with our stuff, with our environments, with everything. And Valeria will know as, a, as a somebody who collects, you know, we are always engaged in, in putting together a world that is inherent and authentic to us and that fascinates me. Um, clothes are something that I feel very tender towards because I think it's the first thing that in particular women and as a woman I can only speak as a woman that we use to define ourselves or how we would like to be seen by the world and I feel very tenderly about that I think women fight very hard to be seen and that's a way that we can really feel that we're making and shaping ourselves and I feel that in my work I'm constantly looking at that and I'm also looking at the falsifications um, like this particular piece I've taken a Queen Dynasty vases and supplanted them with images from the Comte de Garçon collection that was at the Met and I like this idea of mis cultural misappropriation for the greater good of authenticity of self um, and I don't mean that in a, in a cruel mean way I think it's just an interesting thing that we all do in our battle to find who we are in our sort of collective the self that we collect as we go along in life because we're interested in different fashions and styles and different cultural traditions of, and because we, we accumulate yeah, things we to, that, that give us a sense of who we are. And the misappropriation is natural in that. I mean, in fashion it was sort of a running joke that people would always go to me, oh, what's your collection about this season? And you go, oh, it's a 1950s meets 1980s with a dash of Mary Poppins. And then you go, okay. <laughs> and you're like, that's absolutely fine. And the collection could entirely be about that. And actually, I think it's the same with our lives, you know. It's a bit of this and a bit of that, and I shove that in. And no, it's not meant to be together. And it doesn't mean it mean make any sense culturally. In fact, it's culturally entirely wrong. How can you possibly take a, a rug that was made in... Uh, the Yemen and, and bring it over here and sell it in the Conrad shop. It's entirely inappropriate. It's got, you know, your, the Queen's Park home 
doesn't you know doesn't have any relationship to a hand woven rug from halfway across the road but trade and consumerism has driven um, this ability and this desire to show who we are through the things that we we gather around us and that's a conversation that for me is just never endingly fascinating <laughs> yeah I think it's a conversation we are all having really with ourselves and with the media at the moment as as well it's uh, happening in different ways yeah. it kind of it kind of punches out, doesn't it, in different areas in our public discourse at the moment. And we're kind of wrestling it really with it as an idea. And here you are engaging with it in your painting practice. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating discussion on authenticity for me yeah. and how, how the value of it and how relevant it is to us. And how about the conversation with domesticity <coughs> in the painting? And also, because your paintings seem to me um, like they would look um, very appropriate in what we consider appropriate in a domestic setting, the kind of yeah. painting that would hang well in a many... Um, uh, many a lounge as <laughs> we're in the paint lounge. I think there's a sort of an interest in spaces for me and, and in how we inhabit them, how I inhabit them. Um, obviously, as a, as a woman uh, living in the West right now, I have three children. The domestic setting is very relevant for me, and there's a sort of an enclosing, um, whether it be a room, a chair, a vessel, these things are all holding holding spaces, holding patterns, and, and that really interests me. Yes, and we put things in our domestic environment that reflect our <coughs> self, yeah. again, and in many ways, and your paintings become um, intertwined in, in that when somebody purchases it and they hang it. I think there's also this idea of uh, you know, these are spaces that are familiar to us, which allows me, as someone asking questions, to distort the space and yet it's still recognisable. We immediately I mean that the, it can be a rug and it cannot fit, it cannot work, the perspective can be wrong, it can be different, it can make no sense, yet you recognise it, you recognise it immediately from some key signifiers as being a type of domestic space. And I think it's these signifiers that are so interesting right now. We can only ever as artists comment on our time and our place and those are those are places that are familiar and easily signified and therefore distorted so questions can be asked and <coughs> I can ask them of myself and, un and not resolve them which leaves it sort of open for future discussion. Yes and then the people that acquire your work their own, um, their own associations and their own they bring their own sense of self to yeah. it because when people buy work sometimes it sometimes says something about themselves um, that you mean sometimes you buy work to have it to, uh, to engage with an aspect of yourself which is my link to <laughs> Valeria because you're a collector there are many links here. <laughs> many many links yeah. Yeah. yes yes yeah and, and I, I always used to find the idea of a collector mysterious because we, we didn't collect art at, at home in, in my family for instance well um, my parents were not uh, collectors of contemporary art. They were not connoisseurs of antiques, but I grew up with uh, furniture, tapestries from 1500, 1600 Italian. So really a sense of beauty, a sensitivity to beauty, to beautiful objects and things. And when I discovered contemporary art, I, I couldn't believe it. You have the actual makers. Uh, the opportunity to meet them and to engage and to ask uh, and, and, and to really have an experience uh, out of that. So immediately, just for me, the connection with the artist was, uh, was essential. And it's been essential, it's always. Uh, and uh, the, the, the thing about um, identity and uh, with women and fashion is so true. I love fashion as well. And, and it's a way to express yourself. Um, it's not a strategy on anything, it's really a self-expression, very spontaneous way of just, uh, you know, also having fun. Um, collecting is an extra level of, uh, of separation from you, uh, but that's also a way of uh, expressing your vision and, and, uh, and yourself. So for me, uh, collecting many women artists and a specific I have a specific, uh, I think, um, taste, and I think you can see in my collection what I like and what I, what I am attracted to, and uh, so really, it's uh, it's a personal journey of discovering yourself 
through uh, the work of others, of, uh, of expressing yourself, of, uh, of uh, personal growth. Uh, whenever I meet an artist, uh, it just opens doors to, to unlimited possibilities of, of conversation, of growing and seeing life in a different way. I mean, I always say, really, nature is fantastic, it's beautiful. You go out there and you see incredible landscapes and, and anything, but art, you, you, you cannot, artists make something that you will never be able to experience unless, just because they make it. So you are able to experience something extraordinarily new, and uh, and, um, and, and and so this is why really I collect. Also, it's not they are not objects for me like they were for my parents. For me, it's uh, it's a it's a it's a journey with people. It's about people. It's a journey with people. It's always been a very collaborative aspect of what I do. It's not me sitting in my Leave a room and say how beautiful these pieces are, and just after you know <coughs> behind closed doors, it's actually really it's these are the starting point of a journey and conversation that I want to have not only with the artists but with curators, with with uh, with galleries, with people around me, and uh, this sense of community, the the desire to be part of a community, and the excitement of being part of a community. Uh, that's essential to me as well uh, since the very beginning. So I'm really very excited. Just I feel part of the artwork community, my own community. There are different types of artwork, obviously. Uh, but really, um, to do a journey with like minded people, with extraordinary people who really um, touch you, your life in a, in a way that is, is so impactful to you as a person, a human being, to grow mentally, uh, psychologically, emotionally, um, it's, it's priceless. Do you? Um there's so many questions I want to ask because it's just about the process, really, yeah, of choosing absolutely. something. I absolutely. find that it's really, it's, yeah. it could be anything. I mean, because everybody's taste, like you say, yeah. is a very personal thing. Yeah. But it's very hard to express it with art. I think art's quite frightening. You go to a gallery, they can be really frightening places, places absolutely. where they sell art. You often have somebody sitting down. It's intimidating. A, they are, but they should be the opposite of intimidating But because we don't, there's something about expressing ourselves through our choices of what we see that is quite difficult to find your way. How did you find your way? Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah, so what, I, what I did, I, uh, I, as a collector, I was born in New York in 1997, but before then I, I took at the Fashion Institute of Technology, love in fashion, um, I took a master degree in our gallery administration. I, I had my undergrad degree at, from NYU in journalism. So I just was interested in finding, finding out about contemporary art, which I, at the time I didn't know so much about. And uh, my sister graduated FIT, and so she suggested me to go and to study there, to make some graduate studies. And, and they had museum studies, and they had art gallery studies. And I, and, I, and I wanted to go into this art gallery administration because I thought it's more dynamic, they deal with young artists, and that's what interests me. And I, need, I needed to figure out how the artwork functions, who does what, and, uh, and for two years I met extraordinary people, really, uh, inspirational collectors, artists, galleries, guest speakers, faculty members, really in incredible people. And I just sit, and I would not just sit, I actually was look, going around, meeting people, and listen a lot, listen and looking. And after two years, uh, I started collecting. So these two years really were so empowering uh, because I matured and, and I knew how I learn how the artwork functions. It's a foggy place for, uh, also for me now as well, but uh, not really anymore, but, but really it's a, it's, yeah, it's in intimidating in the beginning. But you know, you go, you ask questions, you are, uh, you want to learn, you want to know, no matter what the purpose of it. And uh, so I started collecting since the very beginning was a, a woman, 
work, the very first work that I got. Yes, you're known for, um, you've become known for collecting just women. Women artists, yes. yes. The work of female artists, yes. And since the very beginning was what I wanted to do. I just, and it's not, it was not a strategic choice, you know, it was really something that came very natural after two years of this full immersion in contemporary. Um, the ni 1990s, late 90s was really a moment of uh, a lot of artists like Cindy Sherman really doing incredible work and being recognized for it, starting being recognized for it. So I was really. Uh, attracted to this work. I was really, uh, really engaging with what we're doing and, and excited about these new languages. Uh, at the same time, there were really, you know, there were really people like, groups like the Guerrilla Girls, very vocal oh, about... Yes, I remember the Guerrilla Girls very yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah very amazing. vocal about, they just yeah. had a show at the Serpentine recently, yeah. very vocal about uh, the discrimination and imbalance in museums and commercial galleries, uh, you know, that female artists were suffering. So, so these, these elements, and the fact that really I'm a feminist, so these elements together really, Played big, mainly for me. I really said since the very beginning I'm going to collect, create a collection. So it was a little bit probably very, very. I was very excited. I mean, it just was the best, the most incredible uh, discovery in my life uh, about myself. And so I said, well, I want to create a choir of female voices within the art world, and uh, and it's going to be. And I knew that it was going to be something that takes me through my life. Uh, in a capacity or another, if I'm lucky enough to continue to collect, well, fantastic. If I'm not in any other capacities, it doesn't really matter, but the commitment is there, and I knew since the beginning. For me, that's like the kind of realization that you want to do art um, as well, the, yeah. the fact that you have this, this vision. Yeah. And then saw this choir of female voices yeah. that do yeah, yeah, to orchestrate yeah. the conductor. Oh. <laughs> no, not really. Yeah. But, but, but I'm part of them. I mean, part of it, yeah. yeah, and to, to travel this journey with such incredible people that I have in my life, and I know 99.9% .9 of the artists in my collection, and there are quite a few, and I, really to have this journey together, um, it's, it's priceless. It's, it's what uh, what many collectors are not interested in uh, because people are different. Uh, but yeah, this is for me a, a, a life a, a life with, with many incredible people. And the way of supporting artists is not just buying their work; it's really engaging in conversations and it's uh, exchange. Uh, it's um, it's. You know, I introduce people to people, I host dinners in my place with a lot of artists, curators, collectors, galleries, uh, designers, and, and, uh, and bringing people together uh, who can really just be excited about meeting each other and maybe collaborate or you know, just things happen in a way and, 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 and also you can support in many ways as well, again, supporting supporting a publication of an artist, a project, uh, introducing the artist to other people, and uh, and just talking because really, as 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 you know, I mean, it's so important, Sarah, to the conversation uh, with people, probably uh, also with collectors, and, and collectors sometimes or, or art buyers underestimate uh, how important is this uh, this dialogue. And uh, or maybe they're not interested. In it. Oh, what do you think? Well, I've, I've known Valeria for a while, and we got involved in a conversation a number of years ago. And um, one of the things that Valeria does from the beginning is uh, invited me into her home and very generously connected me with other people. And but it's also, I suppose, it, it comes back to this idea of looking at art and, yeah. and allowing a situation to develop where art is seen. Um, so Valera's home is uh, full of, of incredible art and she's very generous in letting anyone 
ask, who's that by? What's that? How, how did you get, why did you buy that piece? And, and these, it is these beginning conversations. And as I said, I came from fashion and um, yes, it's a foggy place when you first enter the art world and you don't know who anyone is. Um, often if you don't have a, a background in art, you don't know who certain artists are. Um, as a woman, you may not know who other women artists are who've made landmark work that you, you kind of want to know, you really kind of need to know about. It's a discussion that it's impactful for me. Um, you can't, you don't make work in a vacuum, even though you work alone. So there is, yeah. you know, the entire weight of art history and contemporary artists uh, working around you. And as a, as a female artist, as a feminist, those collections like Valeria's have been important for me because you sort of go, oh, okay, how has this collection been shaped? How is what artists are in it, and and why are they in it? And that's a it's about educating yourself. And we all, as uh, as artists, as viewers, as as people exposed to the art, need to understand the conversation. If it's an entirely different language that no one's exposing us to, we can't be expected to understand it or engage in it. So I think that that's incredibly important. And I suppose also we talk about hospital rooms, and this work is then exposed to people who might not otherwise. Have the have the chance to see it mm -hmm. or engage in it or know what it's about. So I think it's and it's, domesticity is yes. interesting because I don't have a museum and I'm not really interested to I don't know the future but to open anything just to hold my collection in there. But I, we live with art and I have three kids and they grew up surrounded by really crazy pieces and and um, and so we we live with it and so. Thinking yeah. about how how architecture dictates our our behavior, where mm -hmm. we are, really, you know, it's 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 linked to how we behave, yeah. and so it's to have this this opportunity to do something so relevant to uplift people's people's spirits, and we all know that that um, that emotions dictate how we how we dictate also our health you know it's so important to be happy to smile and to be exposed to great colors shapes or uh, and and because that it's a make you know it's gonna make you feel great mm -hmm. and that will help <coughs> with, with other health issues physical issues totally interlinked mm -hmm. and I totally believe in that mm -hmm. so it's 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 really absolutely extraordinary uh, hospital rooms really well, I think I just really love the idea of infiltrating spaces that wouldn't ordinarily maybe kind of have access to the arts or and actually we do hospital rooms obviously which um, is a charitable endeavour but we also have the Denton's Art Prize which for very, very kindly judge and that is about bringing artwork into a corporate law firm mm -hmm. so it's something com completely different and also the same you know that yeah. Ordinarily, that contemporary art would not be in those rooms. But I love the notion that where a meeting is happening about, you know, some very legal, administrative, global issue, is watched over by Matthew Krishnu's painting of two boys, and it looks like you're, you know, looking into somebody's memory or looking into someone's, you know, it's like this idea of a productive imagination that you know we can infiltrate these spaces we can be relevant outside of our bubble and i also interested in how we can establish economies that support artists so the denton's art prize has a financial prize so it's five thousand pounds every six months so that's about you know redirecting financial kind of resources into the arts community to artists who are not, you know, necessarily really well known in the market, but that are plugging away, they're working, they are working other jobs or whatever they're doing, but, you know, it's um, a financial injection. And with hospital rooms, we pay our artists as well. So about trying to establish economies that are slightly separate from the market, where big galleries do control a lot of where the money is or, you know, how, how much people can buy work or you know, that we could kind of create working jobs for artists that value their skills, 
their abilities and that kind of make life better. Yeah, and I think it really helps people to own their imagination when they look at art, because I have a slight problem with the idea these days that almost people feel that their imagination isn't their own, but everybody's imagination belongs to themselves, and, they, and art is the place where they can express themselves, not necessarily by making it, but by what they see inside it and what and, and what it brings to themselves and that, and that comes out of them to meet the painting. And this is what you're doing a huge amount, I think, also with your cabinet of curiosities by bringing contemporary art, not um, the not art that's been made previously, but art that's relevant, that's being made today um, by artists that might be considered important or, or interesting for one reason or another, you're taking it into places and that the cabinets are, are incredible, small, uh, sort of on a small scale bringing... Well, um, so actually that was a commissioned gallery. project, but that was with London College of Fashion and it was a transportable exhibition for audiences that couldn't reach you know, galleries or museums. So it went to a women's prison, an older people's home, a mental health unit, and to a, a kind of small community space in Poplar Harker. Um, and for that, actually, it was very much engaged with fashion. And what I was thinking about is the audience um, had one thing in common, which was time. You know, that people in prison or in a mental health unit or something that all of the kind of negative associations with time like isolation or loneliness or you know they were a big issue for, for that particular audience but how might we think about time being an asset and where kind of hand-driven craft weaving touch you know things that take time and some of us think we don't have any time we don't have this time to you know to do, engage in these things so I put a show together with lots of Hand, handmade fabric and then we had workshops where we were weaving and we were making fabric basically um, so that was that project which is slightly different again um, but yeah I think there's interesting things how we can change you know change how we think and how we see people and how we see ourselves it's interesting because we keep sort of talking about the every time we, we discuss something we seem to be talking about art outside of the gallery yeah. and that's really interesting because we talked about domestic spaces we talk about physical spaces we're talking about um, you know, mental health hospitals we we're talking about care homes earlier it seems to be you know the value of, of art which has been in some way curated by somebody's point of view for whatever reason or to whatever end outside of the gallery space and that's really interesting because it's a different dialogue that happens there than happens within the gallery. Mm. But also the power, the power of art, power to change people's perspective, the power to, to mean something beyond its own medium. I mean I see with my collection um, on female artists and uh, all these incredible artists I think first of all are great artists it's not that it's a it's an act of pitiness or uh, for them uh, nobody buys them and <laughs> buy them so it's really these are first of all great artists but um, this sense of purpose that art has and and uh, uh, the ability really to change how we see the world is really there and and, uh, and I, as my collection grows and little by little I just I've, I've been so overwhelmed by the fact and that, that, that really people look at it like uh, well it represents something more than the sum of its parts mm. it's not this artist plus this artist plus this artist represents something bigger and uh, and I'm very thankful for, for that mm -hmm. even though I think it's just unfortunately there <laughs> this is because women artists have been discriminated and totally neglected and, and nobody really ever you know has ever uh, given a balance uh, um, but uh, opportunity uh, so it's really this this sense this I mean this Every work shows me so much how much power is more than than the value itself of. This is why I, if you buy a piece of art and thinking about investment, it's a big mistake. Because if the artist doesn't do well, which is really probably 90% of the time, you 
and that was something you don't particularly like. You bought it because it was supposed to go well, uh, go well meaning you know sell better after you know double the price. And instead, if you buy something that you really love, you end up with it with a piece that you really love, and you really no matter what the artist ends up doing. And I have a few artists in my collection who have really, unfortunately, either slowed down or or stopped. Uh, or, you know, and but I have this incredible piece, uh, and some have slowed down and they're picking up again, which is good. You know, women have other issues besides you know making money. Uh, really, there is life taking over, and the, and artists have issues in their life, and it can be many things. You know, many problems that can dictate your life as an artist, your production as an artist, slowing down or or, or stopping for a moment. So. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but I think it's best because time, now the, the market is taking over mm -hmm. everything, and we're talking about something mm -hmm. that is beyond the art market. Mm -hmm. It's so important. Nowadays, so much about having a career as an artist. Artist is not a career, it's a life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, women, is it different to men? Because I think um, probably coming to the end of the discussion now, we should finish it with thinking about oh. women in particular. <laughs> <laughs> We're all women here, we're all interested in the role of art, uh, um, women makers, um, women uh, collectors, you know, yeah. um, women who, who just appreciate art, who might not make or collect anything. What, what do we think? Is the is there anything particular about this moment in time for women yeah. in yeah. the I mean, art world? Uh, I, I can say from a collector's point of view, and from from someone engaged with as a as a as a patron, or as a, you know. Uh, um, it's a moment where really contemporary art has, has, has attracted so many so much attention and. Uh, and but, but the attention goes to the wrong, <laughs> goes in the wrong direction, and really, and uh, yes, uh, there is uh, more visibility, there is more awareness about female artists being uh, discriminated or being, you know, left behind. Uh, become kind of like uh, trendy to exhibit these artists or fashionable. So that's think that we don't want to happen. Uh, what we are missing is not just another you know, show of all female artists or showcase of this. It's, it's the discourse, the critical analysis and discourse around the practices of female artists, what it means to be an artist on the perspective, on the point of view of a woman. Uh, do you need to be radical to be relevant? Uh, what it, does it mean to be experimental and be relevant in terms of your practice as an artist? So we already all, always heard men's voices in this, and the men's voices are very well documented in the art history. Women are totally absent. So how do you address art history? You go back and reshuffle everything. Uh, well. Don't know. <laughs> so this is a big issue. I mean, to me nowadays, and it's not just the market. Of course, market helps because really artists need to survive. They need to sell, um, and, and that is, you know, unfortunately, bad art is selling and good art is struggling, uh, and, uh, and that that is the, 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 the case nowadays. But uh, um, but so how do we how do we address? the lack of discourse, analysis, critical analysis around the practice of women artists and how we, do we address it and readdress it in our piece and in the future. It's, um, from my perspective, it's, um, I am privileged enough that I have never needed to turn around and say I feel I feel there's some prejudice against me as a woman. I take it as a matter of course that my, the work I'm making is the best work that I can possibly make. Um, I definitely don't pitch myself against uh, a, an opposite of gender or an opposite of colour or an opposite of anything. My work is mine and it has a right to, to be out there and I, and I recognise that there are some practical Hurdles. I mean, I, we can't address art history. Yes, there have been uh, women have been underrepresented in art history, but we can't we can't retrospectively do that. Um, all we can do is um, actually go forward and make sure that that uh, the best work made by whoever it's made is out there. As Valeria said before, I don't buy 
artists as we- I don't buy women artists work because it's a shit work that's left over at the end of the show because <laughs> obviously you know I think the assumption is that women are making relevant and important work today in society and it will it is harder um, I, but I found age to be an, if- an issue actually I found, oh, but I found another, oh, another, you know so there's, there's the fact issue. that there's my vagina and yeah. my age I mean like the whole thing together having an old vagina is basically not good in the art world um, yeah. but um, can we cut that bit <laughs> So there, there are certain, uh, there are always hurdles. Um, there are also hurdles, though, being being poor, having to work uh, three jobs in order to stay your practice. There are so many hurdles in uh, in terms of making work, mental health. Um, everything seems to stand in the way of, of making good work. So I think that you know, having voices that champion women and say, "Here, I've got your back," is in- incredibly important. Um, but, but as an artist, it's important for me not to engage in any any thought process other than the, the work has to be good. I yeah, have to be absolutely. evolving. It's about quality. Mm. It's not about anything else. Yes. There are incredible artists and there are women, and why are they left behind? Why they are totally ignored? We are missing on so much talent. That's the issue. And it's true. I mean, uh, how do you go retrospectively? You can do anything you can. You can little, but but really, I mean, it's how we do it now. And uh, let's not let's not become trendy. A trend. Yeah. I think each of our different roles is kind of a slightly different. And as curator, is a funny word, but I think when you're exhibition making or presenting projects to the public then I identify strongly as a feminist and I would be very conscious about the distribution of genders that are represented in my project. So I would think I, it wouldn't be um, okay if I just had men. Similarly, I probably wouldn't ordinarily just have women and I would think about the different groups that are represented. If I'm looking at hospital rooms, I'm thinking about what communities are served mm. in the units, how artists can be you know, reflective of those people um, and I, I'm all for quotas or for you know if that's the step that need to be taken um, obviously the XX project is you know I couldn't sing those praises strongly enough to oh, you. you know facilitate the acquisition of work by women into collections it is a innovative and fantastic initiative you know and that is addressing our history you know that is taking a very measured um position and saying we we can address it in this way you know um and it's also supporting and training our women you know empowering our women to you know if it's even (laughs) entrepreneurial skills or business skills or and then we also have the question of care and how we can make care an equally feminine and masculine responsibility so that all of our care roles aren't allocated on the shoulders of women. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's, it's 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 so important to to have communities. And this is why XX uh, exists because I always look at reality that are overlooked, like female artists, like artists who are not uh, who are not they are super famous or artists or really the moment I come in, they re- really I make a difference for them. Mm-hmm. You know, the support makes a difference because nobody's looking in that direction. Going into the regional museums and donating every year a work by female artists, one of the regional museums, they don't have I mean some of them have zero women. In their in their collection. Yeah, it's really the vast majority is yeah. definitely. Yeah, and this is what stop. XX is doing with contemporary society. Some of them have ten, mm. the vast majority, no more than ten percent. The application we receive is is by itself is the job that just gives me, you know, gives me so much satisfaction. Not that I'm happy about that, mm. but there is already mm. a big job done mm. having this museum addressing in a, in a statement saying, you know, by the way, we have zero female artists. And then it's just a sense of, of, uh, of also you know, making something that is reacting to it. Mm. So uh, how can you, can you imagine communities not being exposed to contemporary art? 
schools, children, older people, you know, you know, people with mental health issues or health issues. Um, so when you look at this regional museum and don't have, they don't have one female artist, uh, how can you educate women to, to uh, you know, to be creative, mm -hmm. to go after their dreams. The vast majority of, of uh, population is not dreaming to become a doctor or dreaming to become a, a lawyer or, a, or a, I don't know, whatever, uh, an economist. Uh, is dreaming to become something else. And so artists make it for me, you know, they, uh, you step into your own shoes and not someone else's shoes. You create your own world and for other people, for yourself, for other people and, and to inspire other people as well. So for me, I have a daughter with Down syndrome and for me, she's not going to be probably, no, I know you're not, but, but she's really, I think, is going to learn so much out of uh, all the artists that we know and the, like Sarah and, uh, and just go after your dreams and create something that is not there. Mm. That's a brilliant um, that the, you've been coming up this art, the transformational power. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. May I just irritatingly ask one more question? Go on. What is the response to the work that you yeah. that you have from the people who who are exposed to it? Do you get a market response, and do they enjoy it? Does it? Do you see the effects of it giving back? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in every project, it's almost like a roller coaster trying to because you know you desperately want people to like things, you know, mm. but actually the question isn't of like. The question isn't, do you like it? It's providing eight very different propositions, eight very different rooms, that hopefully you will like something, but you will have the opportunity to give your opinion. And if you don't like it, let's talk about it. You know, let's talk about your experience, why you don't like it. And if you do like it, great too, let's talk about that. <coughs> if, we, if we only provided artwork that is likeable, we would become mm -hmm. very banal. Mm -hmm. You know, so but also a, uh, it's, it's, it does something unconsciously that you can't describe. Mm. Even if when you don't like it, I mean, my, my kids didn't like, doesn't, they don't like. You so have some very difficult work. Yeah, very some difficult. Some of it is difficult. And but but you know, like yeah. a friend of mine told me one time, it was just someone, you know, as a pharmaceutical company, and he said, after all, what is what is an artwork? I mean, it's colors, shapes, and these are just wavelength through your brain. And for a kid or for anybody unconsciously it does something mm. so that's it's not a like ability as you say is what is it going to do on an unconscious level to all these people mm. and it's a lot mm. yeah i think um we should take a couple of questions from the floor um before we finish um, so has anybody got anything they've been burning to ask Sarah Pager. Uh, hello. <laughs> hello. Really nice to meet you all and really great talk so far. Valentina, I'm just really interested in the way. Valeria. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't mind. Valeria, <laughs> I'm very interested in how you how you form your collection. How important would you say? Because you seem to forge actually quite personal links between the artists that that you um, have worked on How important is this dialogue with the artist to the fact that you're actually... Uh, it is important for me to meet the artist yeah, to actually... Is it? Is it? Yeah, yeah, to include. And how does this relationship actually... Evolve. Evolve, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's I know 99% of the artists that I collect, but, but some of them I get to know them after probably I start buying their work. But it's always a process, as you were saying, it's, it's a journey, it's a process oriented uh, thing, I mean, you know, I mean, it's not like, boom, I see it, I buy it, it's it, finished. I really, it's a process of conversation, I start talking to the galleries, and then I ask for a studio visit, and then I go to the studios, and then start engaging with, with, with the artists and, and the work, and, and, uh, and, and it goes on and on, and sometimes it takes 
months or years before I get to buy a work by this artist because because I'm not just looking at the artist practice but I'm looking at the body of the work that really speaks to me and so sometimes I need the body of work that really opens the door and uh, and then here I am uh, it's a it's a constant you know dialogue that I have with artists sometimes uh, it happens really fast for my collection and I, I buy an artist really uh, but it's always so important that I understand what the artist is doing, that I understand and, uh, and, and love the work and connect to the work as well, not just the artist, but the specific work. Because you can do many, many different types of work, and, uh, but maybe I like uh, you know, this type of work. I like uh, I don't know, your, your recent work more than the, you know, the previous work. So it's, it's not uh, yes or no right away. It's really a, a, a dialogue that continues. But sometimes I don't know the artist. Sometimes I just, um, I just continue the discussion with the galleries and then the first opportunity that I have, I do a studio visit if it lives, she lives far away. Yeah, I wanted to ask that as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Question for Sarah. Um, when we were hanging your painting uh, last night, you were musing about why you use two surfaces. Uh, because the images are. are not I work in. Well, this actually is one of the more sort of aligned pieces, but still there's a distortion. I use panels for a couple of reasons. It's a compositional tool. Um, as I said earlier on, when I start a work, I don't often know what the work's going to be. Um, I'm sort of searching, but I don't even quite know what I'm searching for. Um, so I, I sometimes realise, oh God, I need another panel. It's going to be bigger than this, or actually I'm going to take that away. Sometimes in working, I'll separate the panels and work on them as individual spaces, and then I'll put them back together and see if they're still working. It's a means of uh, distortion mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and compositional play, and I use play a lot in my work. Um, so it has multiple functions. And it works so really well. I mean, when you look at that, you have to really slow down and say, hmm, what's going on here? Because often it will just go past you, go, oh, yeah, I'll get that. What makes you... It creates a problem. And I think I'm looking for a problem in yeah. the work. Um, and I don't always solve the problem but the work, the work can function better with it unsolved and, uh, and creating these boundaries and these problems. Again, maybe going back to this original point that we made at the beginning about designers and, and artists and now asking to artists to work as designers is something that actually, for me, the lack of boundaries in being an artist was incredibly problematic. So I create my own boundaries and one of these boundaries would be um, the way I start my works, which is always with a, with a form of patterning, and with these panels, which are again problematic, because it's always too small or too big. Mm -hmm. So again, I then have to respond, and I, it's my response to the work that keeps the work moving forward. Like, like a game of backgammon, if you like. Yeah, you make a move and you're gonna get something back, and it's partly the role of the dice, and partly your own strategies for working, and in the end, hopefully, you have a good game. Great. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, so many people. Question for me. Um, do you know if any of the service users in hospitals have been inspired to create their own work by the art that you've put into those rooms? Yeah, so part of the project as well um, is that we all run creative workshops after all of the installations are finished so that we can talk about what the artists have created, gauge people's responses, kind of. Um, and also to encourage their own creative practice. Um, so each artist will come back and have a two hour session where they share a bit more of their work and will paint or draw or make something. And it was funny, we had one commissioned by Gavin Turk who we were actually quite apprehensive about because it was a really graphic vinyl of two eggs, one balancing on top of the other. And it's very conceptual work. and. As I said, we always want people to like things, but it's a challenging piece to put into this environment. And actually, one of the service users uh, made a piece of a portrait of herself as an egg. You know, but it was a nice moment, you know. Um, 
uh, and that was not even in a workshop, you know, that was a separate um, thing. So absolutely we would try and encourage creative practice as much as we can at the same time. Um, Liz? Uh, I was going to ask this question to Valeria. I think everybody on the panel is going to be on it. Um, Valeria, you talked about the wrong art being taught. Um, and I was thinking about women's voices and the, there's a resonance with some of the discussions in, um, about the quality of pay in the BBC. Women being criticised for not shouting, not asking for more. Um, I have a question, how do you find those quiet voices? Well, do you, you must have a whole art book shouting at you. How do you know about the people uh, well, uh, it's, that it's, stay it's, in Yeah, it's, it's really uh, a, a great journey. I mean, I, I, I always say that my best, that I don't have advisors, I, I art advisors, I just do my journey uh, by myself. I would never want to give this the pleasure of doing this research and this dialogue to someone else. Uh, it's the whole journey that matters to me. So I, uh, it's the artists are my best advisors. I have constant communication uh, with artists, curators, and this is a, a, my my support system that I built for so many years, and, and which I'm very proud of, because. People trust what I do, they know that I'm not speculating, that I'm not buying to sell after. They know that uh, I'm there to support as much as I can, and uh, they know that you know I'm genuine in what I do. It's not there is no other second you know ideas or secret uh, meaning to what I'm, I'm doing. It's really for the love of the artist, and the artist comes first, and everybody knows it. So I, this this support system that I created, I'm very proud of, and and. Uh, and, uh, and so the way I get back what I give, the support I give to the artists is by, by, by them to be really uh, supporting what I do by giving me access to their best work, uh, by giving me the opportunity to support uh, also great projects. It's, uh, it's really been um, an incredible journey uh, and satisfaction for me to see uh, how much you know uh, they respect what I do as well. The, there is so much out there, uh, as I said, you know, bad art has been pushed and it's been uh, really probably more successful, uh, not probably for sure economically speaking, than great art. Great artists with great, incredible ideas, more conceptual and also commercial, uh, and been struggling. And these are artists who have been working, and I see them working for 20 years. So really, I've been immersed in this for forever, and uh, forever, for 20 years. And, um, and I always look at the reality that are overlooked. I don't like to be part of, uh, of you know, uh, I, I mean, uh, the thing is that I want my action to have an impact, to make a big difference. And so, uh, you know, artists at any stage of their career, they need, they, need, they need help. But more and more when they are alone and nobody's looking. So at that stage, I come in, and I've always done it since the beginning, and I'm not changing now. And, and that is really uh, what creates a strong link between me and the artist, because you know, just helping them, they will never forget. And I don't forget how much, you know, we help each other and how much this dialogue means to me and means to me and how much they support my collection as well. It's a give and take, it's a, it's a dialogue, it's a, it's a relationship that has been built. And so, uh, and I'm curious, I, I just approach people, I, I, I look after uh, artists, I do research, uh, this is my life 24-7 uh, and, and, um, and it's, you know, it's what I do every day. It's not just during, you know, a moment of a biennial or an art fair, 24-7. I think we met at a student show, actually. Sorry? I think we actually met at a student show. Yes, yeah. yes. That I mean, literally, yeah, we students met... Students of Thomas Epps. And, um, yeah, it's... Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I had some work in a show and I was curate I was invigilating because it was a student show and she walked in. I mean literally I think her one visitor all day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, this so is literally Thomas, trawling. And this is Thomas, trawling, uh, the art this yeah. is Toma, the artist who organized organized who just uh, she organized it? Yeah, it was, a, it was, it was an artist. It was an artist. Uh, it was um, it's when I was at Slade, and I organised it with Alistair McKinvin and Tom. Okay. And and then yeah, and Valeria and walked in, and and I actually recognised her because she'd been in a, a magazine and an interview that I'd read, and she was wearing a really good outfit, and I'd remembered <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> because no, because you don't often get like you, these, these articles can be quite dry. You know, someone sitting there behind their desk, curator, blah blah blah, and she was wearing some mental outfit and uh, standing there with all this crazy like art around her. I was like, oh, she's really cool. And I, I just remembered it, and it must have been a number of years since it had come out. And she walked in, I was like, I know you, and she's like, uh, I don't think you do. Do you want to show you around? She's like, listen, thanks, but no, I'm going to do it on my own. And, uh, and she walked around and then she came back and was asking questions about who was this and who did this and who did this. So, yeah, like a kind of a grassroots approach to, no, to looking at things. Is, is Toma, the yeah. artist, well-known artist, Toma Epps, uh, who just told me, Valeria, you should go and see this. You really are going to enjoy just seeing these artists. are all my students. And, uh, and so I'm totally grateful for that, really. And, and, and this, is, this is just... Uh, um, a present for me from the artists always coming and say you should look at these other artists work and I trust them more than anybody else's and do you kind of have something to say about quiet voices and uh, following on from what Liz was asking I think I'm quite fortunate as well with my community and Denton's does help me with that as well because I'm constantly looking for people um, so that net gets cast quite broadly, but I think also with hospital rooms, we we really value the quieter people. You know, it's the kind of project where your ego has to like stop at the door. There's no, there's nothing about you really when you endeavour. You know, you take part. So we value it quite strongly. Um, no, not really. No. I'm speechless for once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we do well, have to. Yeah, uh, no, I guess we do have to do the wrap up because it's just it's, it's been a great conversation. But sitting is always difficult for fidgety people like me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.